Okay, good evening. evening. If you want to grab your Bibles and turn to, uh, we're going to be looking at three books tonight. Three books of your New Testament, uh, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. And uh, so if you want to grab, uh, grab a Bible and flip over to those three books, we will be trying to just do a brief overview uh, of those books tonight to try to put those books into, uh, into their context. Uh, let's try to remember how Paul's epistles came about. Uh, these are 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus or three of Paul's epistles. Uh, if you put them in chronological order, uh, they will be the last three epistles that he wrote uh, before, uh, before he died. And uh, so we've tried, these are the last three of Paul's epistles that we will be studying. Uh, we started with uh, Romans and 1st, uh, 2nd Corinthians and Galatians uh, because those come first in our New Testament, but those are not the first books that Paul wrote. Uh, the first ones we have from Paul are 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, uh, which we looked at last week. Uh, but then Paul wrote four books while he was in a Roman prison cell. Uh, he wrote uh, Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon uh, when he was there in that Roman prison cell. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we, we don't have a history of Paul leaving the prison cell inside the book of Acts. The book of Acts ends in Acts chapter 28 uh, with Paul in that, uh, in that Roman prison uh, for two years, and then the book of Acts closes. And so we do not have, uh, we do not have any further information. Um, did we run out of handouts? Yeah, handouts? All right, that's a good thing. Um, it, if, uh, if somebody's just dying to have a handout, we'll have an arm wrestling contest and uh, uh, see, uh, see who wins. Uh, I, think most, I think most folks got them. If you didn't, uh, let me know after class and we'll... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll, get you, we'll get you one. Oh, Le- Les and Betty, they've been married for 64 years, and they're going to try to share a handout tonight. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll see if that works. We'll, we'll see. Just, just, just okay. All right, so here's 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. What do we know about these books? These are sometimes called, depending on where, where you're doing your study, these are sometimes called the, the pastoral epistles. Uh, and they're called the pastoral epistles because individuals uh, in, uh, in certain religious circles uh, look at Timothy and Titus as being pastors. And so they look at these three books as the pastoral epistles. Uh, but actually, when you study the New Testament, uh, there are a group of individuals that the, that the New Testament calls pastors and those are not the preachers. Preachers are not pastors. Uh, when you study your New Testament, uh, it is the elders uh, who are called the pastors. It's the elders who are given the name of bishops or overseers or pastors. Uh, they, they all, all of those individuals uh, have the same uh, position, have the same office. And so sometimes they're called the, uh, the pastoral epistles. Uh, I prefer to call them the evangelist epistles because that's what Timothy and Titus were. Uh, they were the evangelists. And so you have Paul writing uh, three personal letters to two preacher friends of his. And uh, these are the last three documents that we have uh, Paul writing. He writes nine letters to congregations. He writes four letters uh, to individuals. And, uh, and obviously Philemon is that other letter. What do you know about the relationship between Paul and Timothy? So, it's like a father son. He, he calls him, when you look in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he calls him in verse 2 to Timothy, a true son in the faith. Paul often referred to and looked at Timothy as his son in the faith. What does that imply? What does that indicate to us about that relationship? Is it likely that Paul was the one who taught Timothy the gospel? That Paul was the one who converted him. Uh, that's often the way that that expression is used. Of someone who's a son in the faith. That someone who, uh, of someone who's taught another the gospel has helped to bring them to Christ. Now when did that happen? Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have that verse written in our New Testament about the day when Timothy was baptized. Uh, but if we were to try to trace uh, the history of Paul and Timothy. Timothy was from the city of Lystra. Uh, 
And uh, Paul came to the city of Lystra on his first missionary journey. Uh, if, you, if we were to look in our Bibles in Acts chapter 14 tonight, we would see Paul coming to the city of Lystra during his first missionary journey. Um, how was Paul received by individuals in the city of Lystra? Did they like him? Uh, it, it, if, if you don't know the city of Lystra, perhaps you know about the occasion when Paul was dragged out of a city and stoned and left for dead because they thought he was dead. That happened in Lystra. Uh, so uh, guess where Timothy was from? Did we already say it? He's from Lystra. Paul goes to Lystra on his first missionary journey. He's stoned while he's in Lystra. Uh, that, and that, that, uh, that, that's not an indication of, his, uh, uh, of anything other than uh, of the fact that they tried to kill him. Timothy had to have been there. When Paul comes back to Lystra on his second missionary journey, he finds Timothy and his mother, who are already Christians. Timothy's mother is a woman who is a, a woman of faith at that point. Timothy is spoken of with high regard by brethren in that area. Now, when did Timothy and his mother become Christians? The, the natural way to look at it is to say that Paul likely taught them the gospel on that first missionary journey. He comes back in Acts 16 on his second missionary journey and picks up Timothy uh, to travel with him now on his second and third missionary journeys. Um, is it possible, is it possible that Timothy had witnessed Paul being stoned? Is that possible? That, that maybe he had even been, been a, a witness of, of Paul being stoned while he, was, uh, while he was there. What kind of an impact do you think that would have had on Timothy? Could have had a couple different impacts, couldn't it? If you were a young man, Timothy would, would have been a, about a teenager. If you were a teenager and you saw somebody stoned because they believed and taught Jesus as the Christ, what would you do as a teenager? What would, it, what would an average teenager do? See you. Not for me. That's an interesting life, but not for this guy. Paul comes back on his second missionary journey. Perhaps uh, when you read 1st and 2nd Timothy, Paul talks about, tells Timothy, uh, reminds him of the fact that he had seen and been a part uh, and known of his, uh, known of his persecutions uh, that he had endured over in 2nd uh, Timothy chapter 3. He talks about that. Uh, if, if you were Timothy and Paul comes back into town on his second missionary journey, he says, I want you to go with me. Really? How many times you've been stoned, Paul? You know, I mean, I saw it happen here. And for all Timothy knew, hey, maybe that happens every city that he goes to. He comes back to town. I want you to go with me. Okay, I'll go with you. So what does Paul do to Timothy to prepare Timothy to go and to teach to the, to the Jews? He has him circumcised. I want you to put yourself in the mind of this young man named Timothy. He's seen a man stoned and left for dead. And then this man says, I want you to travel with me. Then this man circumcises him so that he can go among the Jews. Are you, are you good friends with this guy? What's your relationship? You know, we're, 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 taking, we're taking what we think about all of that and we're trying to, to project it back 2,000 years into that relationship. But when you look at the relationship that built over time between Paul and Timothy, when Paul is sitting in a prison cell in the city of Rome in Acts 28, and he sits down and he writes the letter of Philippians. He writes in Philippians chapter 2, he writes them, I am sending Timothy to you, and I have no one who is of like mind like him. They had formed a bond. They had formed a relationship. And they had formed this relationship in a, in, a, in a gap of age that was probably about 20 years or more. Timothy was likely an, an older teen, maybe in his early 20s, when he joined Paul on, on his first missionary journey. And on his first missionary journey, Paul is probably somewhere more around 50. And here's, here are these two men, separated by 20, 25 years, maybe more in age, and yet they travel, they are... They are 
a team in preaching the gospel. So when Paul, when Paul gets out of prison, when he, the church tradition suggests to us that Paul spent those two years in the Roman prison, and then he got out and he had a period of time where he was free and was able to travel, uh, travel about uh, after the history of the book of Acts. He travels with Timothy. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. Where Paul says, as I urged you, when, in, when I went into Macedonia, he urged Timothy to remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul got out of prison. He spent some time traveling, uh, even with Timothy. And while he was out of prison and traveling, he left Timothy in Ephesus. And after he left him, he sat down to write this letter. Flip over to chapter 3. If you, want, if you want to see Paul's purpose statement, uh, why was he writing, what was his purpose in writing this letter to Timothy? 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. He says, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself. I think the New American Standard doesn't use the word you, but just uses the, that one may know how to conduct himself in the house of God which is the church of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. If you were to read 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15 and then answer the question, what is this book all about? Why did Paul write 1 Timothy? He wrote 1 Timothy so that Timothy and others who would read it would know how the church is to operate. So that they would know how individuals inside the church were to function. So that they would know what kind of work the church was to be engaged in. So that they would know how to conduct themselves or behave themselves inside the body of Christ. And so if, if we take that as Paul's purpose in, in, writing this, in writing this book, and if you look on the top of page 137... If you are one of those individuals uh, who scraped and got one of the handouts tonight, the top of page 137, you have the primary theme, and it's on the screen of what this book is all about. Paul wrote this book uh, in order that the church and its leaders and its members would know how to conduct themselves in accordance with sound doctrine. And so this is a book that not only would impact the church, but it was going to impact individuals' daily lives. Now, if you were to pick up an average letter being written from a preacher to a preacher, do you think it would have any application to you? If you are to pick up an average letter written from an older preacher to a younger preacher, would you think that there'd be anything in there for you? If we turn to 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, we have a letter being written from an older preacher to younger preachers. Does that mean it's only got preacher stuff in it? Does that mean it's, it's a kind of private and I don't need to nose my business where it doesn't belong? Or would there actually be some things in here that would have application to all of us? You've read these books. You know that there's application not just to the evangelist, but there's application that, that is to apply to each and every one. And so on page 137, and obviously in, in, a, in a time of review, or, or an overview, we cannot, uh, we cannot survey and look at everything that we want to do. But on page 137, Roman number, number two, we understand that the church must follow sound doctrine. That's the theme of this book, is the church following sound doctrine. And it's got to follow sound doctrine when it comes to dealing with false teachers. Uh, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus because there were some problems that were, uh, that were happening inside the church. Do you remember in Acts chapter 20? Remember in Acts chapter 20, Paul was on his third missionary journey. Paul is making his way to Jerusalem. He comes to the city of Miletus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. And he calls for the elders of a particular city, of a particular congregation, to come and meet him in Miletus and talk to him. You remember where those elders were from that he talked to in Acts 20? They were from the city of Ephesus. We are reading and studying the book of 1 Timothy. Where was Timothy? He was in, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3, he's in Ephesus. 
What did Paul in Acts 20, what did he tell those elders to be aware of that was going to happen inside their congregation? He told them to beware. Acts 20 verses 28, 29, 30, 31. Beware that there were going to be false teachers. First they would come from without and then they would come from within. And he said, you need to beware of these false teachers. How are they going to come? They're going to be wolves, but how are they going to be dressed? Sheep's clothing. That's got to be uncomfortable, don't you think? Uh, if you were a wolf wearing sheep's clothing, I mean, that'd be a little bit warm. Anybody warm in here tonight? I mean, what's the deal here? Uh, so uh, why would a wolf be wearing sheep's clothing? Oh, he's in disguise. Wolves are s- sneaky little guys, aren't they? You, you ever watch uh, the, uh, um, not the rascally rabbit, what was the other guy? The, the road runner, the other double R guy. It, it, it was, was, there, was there anybody in that that was, that was particular, particularly keen and, uh, and sharp? Not really, right? Um, that coyote was about as dumb as a, as a doorbell. Um, but here, here are wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. What's their purpose? Their purpose was to draw away the disciples after themselves. We get to 1 Timothy. Timothy is here in this city dealing with these false teachers that Paul told the elders they're coming. And Paul told Timothy, as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, you charge everyone that they don't teach any other doctrine than the doctrine that has been received. And so this doctrine applies to everything in the Christian life. It applies to his worship in chapter 2. It applies to the role of men and women uh, inside the church in chapter 2. It applies to, to those men who would serve as elders and deacons uh, in chapter 3. Uh, it applies to dealing with, uh, with this apostasy that was going to come. Look in First Timothy chapter 4. This was already transpiring. They're already dealing with false teachers. But look at First Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says... That in latter times, what word do you have after that? Some. Do you, anybody have the word all? Anybody have the word most? No, it's the word some. That in latter times, some, what will they do? Some will depart from, tell me what your Bible says they would depart from. What faith? Anybody got the word the, the before faith? It's in your Bible. Why is that there? How, how, many, how many faiths are there? There's just one. You look on page 137 in your handout. You look on Roman numeral number one there, where Paul states his purpose for writing 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 15. You look on letter B, that God has a standard. How many times is the faith, that expression, found in this book? Ten times. What was Paul, what was Paul trying to impress upon Timothy as the standard by which the church is to operate. Remember his purpose, that that you would know how to conduct yourself inside the church, not in the building, inside the body of Christ. How will you know how to conduct yourself in the body of Christ? There's a standard. What's the standard? There's the faith, the truth, the word, the doctrine, the gospel, the scripture. How many is there? God just has one standard. And we've got to follow that standard. So 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, There was going to come a time when there would be some individuals who did not want to live by God's standard. And so they would start teaching other things. And so Paul warns Timothy about this, prepares Timothy for this. And he tells him, look down in verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 16 where he tells Timothy, Take heed to yourself and not just to yourself. Take heed to what else? Which doctrine? The doctrine. You watch out for yourself, but also watch out for the doctrine. Because if you continue in them, in you doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Now, sometimes when individuals hear about doctrine or they hear about sound doctrine, all they can think about are, uh, are things that have to do with maybe some externals regarding the church. How is the church organized? How does the church worship? What's the plan of salvation? And sometimes we look at those as, <clears throat> as the doctrinal matters, or we think about that as the only sound doctrine. But look in chapter 5. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Does sound doctrine impact our relationships with each other? Yes. 
What does the word sound mean? As it's used, as it's used, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, what does the word sound mean? Look over on your, uh, look on page 139. Page 139 of your handout, middle of the page, the Roman numeral number six. The church must follow sound doctrine regarding their relationships within the church. Now, what does sound mean? It, it just means healthy. What makes a doctrine healthy? It's not sick, doesn't have a fever, you know, it's not. What, what makes a doctrine healthy? It's correct. It's truth based upon what? Based upon God's standard. So if there is a doctrine that is not based upon God's standard, is it healthy? Not healthy. It's not sound. But those, that, those, that sound doctrine also impacts my relationships with other people. Look in chapter 5, verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man. Those of you who are older... You like that verse, right? Watch out, little boy. You don't rebuke an older man, but how do you treat him? You exhort him as a father. How do you treat younger men? You treat him as brothers. How do you treat, if there happen to be any, older women? You treat him as mothers. How do you treat the younger women? You treat them as sisters. And you're always careful to do that with what? Purity. All purity. And then he gives instructions about... Uh, about widows in the church. Look at how many verses are devoted in this, in this passage, uh, in this book, uh, to how to take care of the widows. Uh, and so much more I, I would love for us to see. Go to chapter 6 and verse 3. Notice how he'll end. He started in chapter 1 and verse 3, say, telling Timothy, you charge them not to teach any other doctrine. Look in chapter 6 and verse 3 at how he comes to close this book. If anyone teaches otherwise... And does not consent to wholesome words. What do you think wholesome words are? Is that like whole foods? I mean, what are wholesome words? True words? Words that, that build you up? Wholesome words. What would be the opposite of wholesome words? Unhealthy, is that what you said? Don't you dare, he says, do anything but give consent to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord. And don't do anything but give yourself to the doctrine which accords with godliness. So one of the main emphases, obviously, in this book is a, cent is a cent centering on sound doctrine. Go over, and I know this is going to be out of order in your minds, but go over to the book of Titus. Flip over two books, get to the book of Titus. The reason that I want us to skip 2 Timothy uh, and go over to the book of Titus is because I want to try to look at them in the order that they're written. Uh, Titus is written in between 1 and 2 Timothy. Uh, remember Paul got out of prison, got out of that Roman prison uh, and uh, traveled with Timothy. He left Timothy in, in, uh, in Ephesus. You look in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, where did he leave Titus? Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Where did he leave Titus? Crete. Crete. Left him in Crete. Why is Paul leaving people everywhere? What's, what's up with that? They're, they are his teachers. Why, why did he leave Timothy in, in Ephesus? He left him there to make sure that sound doctrine was being preached and that people didn't follow after the false teachers. Why does he leave Titus in Crete? Well, look at what verse 5 says. He leaves Titus in, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. What does that mean to you? Set in order the things that are lacking. What could, po he, he, he leaves them with the church in Crete. What could possibly be lacking? Say again. The things that he wrote to Timothy the first time. Okay. All right. There, there were things that there were things perhaps that needed to be taught that hadn't been taught yet. What could be lacking, Judy? Uh, 
Okay? All right, sort of like uh, having some new converts and making sure that the new converts are grounded in the truth. Uh, what, John? True. True. Right. Uh, John says that, that both of these cities are, are port cities and, and you, can do, you can do a lot of work in a little time in those places because the, the people are, as John says, are coming to you. Uh, and so you're able to teach as, as they go on their way. Uh, we, we've noticed this about several cities um, as we've studied through the New Testament, but Crete was another one of those cities that was, was a, a, an immoral city. Look down, and, uh, look down at what Paul says even their own people say. Look in Titus chapter 1 and verse 12. Titus 1 and verse 12. Here's what one of their own people says. One of them, a prophet of their own. Paul says, I'm not saying this. One of their own people saying this. What are Cretans? They're always liars. Notice he doesn't say... The, the, the objection here is these people are liars. They're not just liars. They're always liars. These people are always liars. They're evil beasts and they're lazy gluttons. Besides that, they're decent folks. You know, I mean, this is what, they, this is what their own people are saying about them. So here comes Paul and Titus to Crete. If that's the kind of people who are in the city, perhaps those are, that's bleeding over into the kind of people that are in the church would there be some things that Titus would need to do? He's there to set in order some things that are lacking. One of those things that was lacking, according to verse 5, is that they needed to have elders appointed there. You might remember in Acts 14 and verse 23 that Paul traveled through those cities where he had established the church and he, and he, he established elders. He appointed elders in every congregation. But we, we don't have any indication that Paul had ever been to Crete before we get to the book of Titus. Uh, he, he did go there as a prisoner uh, as he was being transferred from, uh, uh, from Jerusalem to Caesarea and then from Caesarea to Rome. He did sp spend uh, some time there as a prisoner. I don't know that he established the church uh, while he's, while he's in, in route uh, to, to Rome. But uh, this is the first time that we know of that Paul was able to spend some time in Crete as a free man in preaching. But the thing that he does is he says, Titus has to be left here in order that the church might be strengthened and bolstered. Look, look, at, uh, look at some key verses in this book. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot do what? What can God not do? God cannot lie. Do you like that verse? God who cannot lie, what did he do? He promised eternal life before time ever began. And so it's that promise of God that accords with godliness, according to verse 1, that's tied with this sound doctrine that again is a part of uh, the emphasis in the book of Titus. And he is left there in verse 5 to, uh, to set in order things that are lacking. So one of the things that he does is he appoints elders. So the qualifications for elders are given again here in Titus chapter 1 with some of the same ones listed and some different ones given than the ones that are given over in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You look down in verse 10. Was there a need to have elders in the church? Yes, because there were many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially Jews in the church, whose mouths must be stopped. Why? What are they doing? They're subverting whole households, teaching things which they ought not, in order that they might receive some sort of gain from it. So Paul says to Titus, these individuals' mouths must be stopped. Look in verse 13. Rebuke them. How? How does verse 13 say to rebuke them? Sharply. When, when there's false doctrine being taught, is this something to play with? When there are individuals who have tarnished the, the truth and the sound doctrine of God, is this something to, to try to be, uh, to be all light and feathery about? Rebuke them. Stop their mouths. Do not allow these things. Why? Well, because verse 11 says they're subverting whole households. 
Now also, one reason to do it in verse 13 is so that they can come back and teach the truth. So chapter 1 here deals very strongly with some false teaching that was going on in the city of Crete. But then you get to chapter 2 and chapter 3, the book of Titus, and he becomes very personal. And notice in chapter 2 that he addresses some things directly to every person in the church. Verse 2, he addresses the older men. Verse 3, he addresses some things to the one or two women in that church who were the older women. In verse 5, uh, or verse, uh, verse 4, he addresses some things to the young women. In verse 6, he addresses some things to the young men. And so he's, he's covered everybody. They, are there responsibilities for everybody in the church? Yes. Uh, some of those responsibilities are exactly the same. Others have specific and unique roles that they need to fill, and, and he lists many of those there. Look in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation. Now stop there for just a second. What do we know about the grace of God? Does it save us? For by grace you have been saved. Grace saves. Is that all that grace does? Is that all that grace is good for? Grace, it's only a saving mechanism, right? All it does is save. Not according to Titus 2 and verse 11. What else does grace do besides save? It teaches. If grace saves us and it also teaches us, what, do you, what sort of things do you think grace teaches us? Do you think that grace would teach us what we need to do in order to be saved? That would make sense, wouldn't it? So what does it teach us to do in verse 12? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we need to get away from those things. How should we live? Soberly, righteously, and godly. How should we live? Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope of our Lord. What did Jesus ever do for us in verse 14? Gave himself for us. Gave himself for us in order that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people who are zealous for good works. One of the, one of the emphases in this book is on this matter of good works. Go back up to verse 7. In verse 7, we should be a pattern of what in verse 7? We should be a pattern of good works. What does that mean? People ought to be able to look at us, see our good works, and use us as a pattern. Well, if we're going to be a pattern of good works, then verse 14 says, what do we need to be? We need to be zealous for good works. Drop down in chapter 3 to verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain what? Good works. We are to be zealous for good works. We're to be a pattern of good works, but not just one or two times. We are to be a constantly maintaining good works in our lives. Now, why should we do that? I thought works didn't save us. I thought works didn't have anything to do with our salvation. Well... That's not what Scripture says. There's a difference in how the Bible applies works. Why would, why would Paul put all of this emphasis on works and then in verse 5 of chapter 3 say that uh, it's not by works of righteousness that we've done, but according to His abundant mercy that He has saved us. Do we need to do anything in order to be saved? Yeah, there are things that we need to do. There are some works that we need to maintain in our lives, but we need to understand that, that those, those works of which we might boast, those works of which we might go to God and say, hey God, I've done all of these things for you. You ought to save me now. Isn't that what those individuals in Matthew 7 said? Matthew 7 and verse 23, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Look what we did. Have we not done many wonders in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Lord, check, look at our list, God. We've done all of this for you. Look at all of these good works. Well, what kind of works are those? Those are boastful works. Those are works where they say, hey, look at all the great things I've done. And God says, that's no good. That's not what I wanted you to do. 
Well, what kind of works does he want us to do? The works that accord with godliness. The works that are, in, that, that are working with our faith. All right, we have four minutes. Back up to 2 Timothy. There's no way we can cover four chapters of 2 Timothy in four minutes. But when we go to 2 Timothy, we have the last book. We have the last book that Paul ever wrote. Paul is on, uh, Paul is facing death. Look in chapter 4 and verse 6. Paul says in chapter 4 and verse 6, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. What did Paul know? He knew this was it. Now, when you read 2 Timothy, Paul is back in prison in Rome. Remember, we have the four prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. Paul wrote in Rome for, when he was there for two years in that prison in Acts 28. He got out, for the best that we can figure, for about four or five years he was released and had freedom to travel again. But for some reason, he was arrested again, uh, likely in the city of Troas, taken back to prison in Rome. By the time he writes 2 Timothy, he's already been in prison in Rome. Chapter 4 and verse, what is it, verse 16. He's already once stood to defend himself. Uh, he, he's already been put on trial once, and he knows that it's not looking good. Now, the first time Paul was in prison, he wrote the book of Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1, he said, you know, it's possible that I could leave and it's possible I might die. And he talked about being hard-pressed between the two. Ha having a desire to depart and be with the Lord, but having also a desire to stay here and bring more fruit for his work. He looked at the fact he was in prison, and yeah, I could die, but he was more hopeful then. He recognized he was probably going to be released. He's in prison a second time when we read 2 Timothy, and he, he doesn't have that hope. He recognizes that this is the end. And so he writes this letter in a very personal way to a friend of his. And there's a lot of personal elements uh, contained uh, within this letter. But again, the emphasis from a preacher to a preacher is an emphasis on the matter of teaching truth, teaching sound doctrine, making sure that we stay true to the word of God. And so this is the book where we read all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now, why do you think it took Paul to get to his last letter to say that? Well, because that's the nature. That's the nature of the book that he is writing. He is charging Timothy that he remain steadfast and to preach the word. And so in chapter 3 and verse 16, he reminds Timothy, don't forget that you are preaching the word that's not from man, but the word that's from God. Look in chapter 1. We'll look at a couple verses and then we've got to close. Chapter 1 and verse 12 of 2 Timothy is probably one of your favorite verses. For this reason I also suffer these things. The reason that he suffers is in verse 11. In order that he might be a preacher and teacher of the Gentiles. But he says, for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of who I am. I'm not ashamed of my God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of even being in prison. For I know whom I have believed. He's got confidence. And I am persuaded that him in whom I believe is able to keep whatever I've committed unto him until that day. We know that verse because we sing that song. Do we have that confidence? That kind of confidence in God. And so Paul tells Timothy in the key verse in verse 13, Hold fast the pattern of sound words. Whatever you do, do not leave the word of God. And that really is... The theme that carries over in all of these books, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, is holding fast to the Word of God. Don't let go of it. Don't change it. Don't alter it. Don't try to, don't try to, uh, to do something different with it to make it appealing. Stick with it. Because it's in this book where he says in chapter 3 and verse 15, it's the only thing that can save people. If you try to alter it, you try to change it, you're not going to save anybody by doing that. A lot to cover in all three of those books. Hopefully some of that's been helpful to you. Thank you all for your good attention and uh, participation. In